Welcome to Women in the Word, Lesson 2. Last week, BJ did an excellent job explaining Chapter 1, um, that Jesus existed before the world began. He was the Word. He was with God. He was God. He was and is and always will be part of the Godhead, which consists of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Jesus, the Son of God, left heaven and came into the world to bring us salvation. He became flesh and made the world his home. He was heralded by John the Baptist, who went before him to prepare the hearts of men to receive him as Messiah. John the Baptist also introduced him to his followers as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Many did not receive him, but to those who did, he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Last spring, when the Gospel of John was selected for this year's study, I had a unique experience with an app that my oldest daughter gave me um, for my iPhone, and it was simply called The Chosen. Um, how many of you have seen The Chosen uh, video or YouTube? you have a real treat in store. If you have an iPhone, you just type in The Chosen, and it's by Daryl Jenkins. And it has um, just so many new insights. I loved it. So anyway, um, let me see. We know that Jesus lived in Galilee Mo and spent most of his first 30 years in that area. Not in Jerusalem, it's north of there. To be quite honest, I don't think I ever really thought a lot about Jesus' life before his ministry. I never really gave it much thought. It would be likely that he would be aware of some of the men and women in th that area, um, who would later be called his disciples. But f being fully God, he knew who they were and what they were. And think about it for a minute. Um, when we see Romans 5.8, it says, He knew us, even while we were yet sinners, before his Spirit drew us unto himself. Last week, we learned about Jesus, the one who was true light, who arrived from eternity past to shine on everyone coming into this world. The writer of the Gospel of John was one of them who received him. He doesn't mention himself by name, but he did testify in chapter 114, we have seen his glory. We were introduced to John the Baptist, who was preaching in the wilderness, and many were coming to hear him preach. They were repenting of their sin as he made known God's desire for purity of thought and deed. John the Baptist was preparing the way for the Messiah to enter into their spiritual and cultural world. When John the Baptist baptized Jesus, he definitely knew he was the Messiah because the Spirit of God came upon him as a dove, and it remained on him. It didn't leave. John the Baptist prepared the way for the Messiah by teaching about sin and the need for repentance, but he also shared more with his disciples, esteeming great honor and importance to the one who was coming after him. He was inspired to present him as Jesus the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This phrase became familiar in John. The Jews didn't use this phrase much for anything. Many, most people didn't draw that connection that this was the Jesus that was going to be the substitutionary lamb that would have to die in order for this cleansing to take place once and for all. The Gospel of John is quite different from the other three Gospels. 
He offers the things that Jesus did more than the things that Jesus, excuse me, it's just the other way around. He offers the things which Jesus said more than the things that Jesus did. His gospel stresses the deity of God as the Son of God. In the Gospel of John, we do not read about Jesus' early life before he started ministry. We do not read about the temptation uh, that took place in the wilderness after his baptism. We don't read about any of the parables, and we don't hear about most of Jesus' signs and miracles. The seven signs that he does relate have a deeper meaning and some futuristic concept. In our lesson today, we learned that the first two disciples to follow Jesus were Andrew and that other disciple. Most people believe that that was John himself, and this was characteristic. He never pointed it out as himself. The hearts, their hearts had been prepared for that day. Let's look at those two verbs in this transitional moment. It said, John the Baptist was standing. It's like his work is done. John the Baptist's mission was to prepare the way for the Messiah's coming. And he was actually arrested and taken into prison shortly after this transformation took place. Jesus, on the other hand, is walking. He's on the move. Something is about to happen that would change the world. The kingdom of God is starting. His prayer is, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus is beginning to see his followers as they seek him as the new rabbi or teacher. Don't you love the part where um, Jesus turns around and looks at Andrew and John and says, well, what are you seeking and on their comment, where are you staying? Uh, what did he say? Come and see. The scriptures tell us in Proverbs 8, 17, that when we seek him diligently, we will find him. For those of you who are just learning about Jesus, he asks the same question of you. What do you seek? And he invites all of us to come and see. He desires to spend time with us. He has much to teach us, but even more, he desires to impart his love and his joy to us. The, mo the movie Chose The Chosen by Daryl Jenkins shows Jesus possibly living in a tent on the mountainside. One, can you imagine um, sitting by the fireside and having a chat with the Son of God, talking, laughing, eating, enjoying being together and just getting to know each other. Our scripture today indicates it was around four o'clock in the afternoon when Andrew and John came to see where Jesus was living. They probably spent the night with him. The excitement must have been building in their hearts as they listened to what he had to say and know that he was listening to them. There is nothing like being in the presence of God for an entire night. I was almost 12 when I, the Lord opened my spiritual eyes. I knew that I had sinned and I knew my sins were forgiven when I accepted Christ as my personal savior. It was like going from black and white into technicolor. I couldn't wait to share what God had done in my heart and life when, um, and what he could do for my friend, Doreen. Doreen was our junior high student body president who was a beautiful, very intelligent Jewish girl. As I shared my testimony, my heart was broken. She didn't seem to understand. Perhaps... Perhaps I was the first one to share Christ with her. Years later, when I became a mother, I named my oldest daughter's middle name Doreen 
so that I'd never forget to pray for her. And my prayer was that the Lord would send others to water that seed that was planted. And I prayed that he would reveal himself to her as he did to me. For those of you who have accepted Christ as your Savior, do you remember the first person you shared Christ with? Did you have the same excitement that Andrew and John had? How was your testimony received? Andrew and John must have been excited to find Jesus the Messiah to be the true thing, not someone who was pretending to be somebody he wasn't. As soon as Andrew got home, he went to share this encounter with his brother Simon. And when Simon came to check out Andrew's story, Jesus gave him a new name, Cephas, which is Peter in our language, and it means rock. Peter was not always as solid as a rock, as we'll find out. But Jesus knew who he would become. He doesn't have, he does have many other encounters with Jesus, but not in this chapter. In our passage today, we saw only the first five men that followed Jesus. Jesus had a plan for each of their lives. Philip went to tell Nathaniel about Jesus, and Nathaniel seemed confused because he knew from his studies that the Messiah was supposed to be from Bethlehem, right? Not Nazareth, but I'm sure he learned the rest of the story about the nativity and genealogy and the three and a half years of ministry that followed. However, when Jesus met Nathanael, he remarked that he had no guile, no hypocrisy. He was a true Israelite. What a joy to know that our God sees and loves true devotion. He sees it and he loves it. Jesus saw him sitting under the fig tree before Philip even came. The fig tree is where students of the scriptures often sat while reading and meditating on God's word. With Jesus' words of knowledge about Nathanael, Nathanael declared him to be the son of God, the king of Israel. Chuck Messler preached a sermon in which he said that Jesus also knew what Nathanael was reading. How do we know that? Jesus told him that he would see greater things than Jacob saw. And Jacob, in his dream, was seeing the angels coming and ascending and descending. Jesus said, you will see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. He indicated that he, Jesus, is the ladder. He's the connection between heaven and earth. We can keep that connection with Jesus today through reading the Bible, uh, devotional books, meditating on scripture, mostly prayer, being aware of his presence and being thankful for everything we see around us, praising him. Keeps our connection alive, doesn't it? As my husband and I were reading a devotional called Jesus Always this last August, the passage on being chosen by God spoke to my heart when it said, my, chose, my chosen people are holy and dearly loved. I know that you are neither perfect nor sinless, but you are indeed holy in my sight. This is because I see you wrapped in the radiance of my love. As my follower, you are covered with perfect righteousness forever. Jesus wants to clothe us with compassion, kindness, gentleness, and patience. His disciples are transformed by the Holy Spirit, but it doesn't happen overnight, does it? What kind of men did Jesus choose? Some were hardworking fishermen, mostly uneduca uneducated Galileans. Some had wives. Some had good-paying jobs. The scriptures tell us these men followed immediately when he asked them to follow him. 
they were willing to leave everything behind and were ready and eager to share him with family and friends. And history reveals that they were loyal and willing to the end to suffer and die for him. Now let's look at Jesus a little bit more cl clearly. He wasn't just a Jew. He was a Galilean. He spoke to his disciples in the Galilean vernacular, heart to heart. He gave these followers the Sermon on the Mount. He told them that they would be fishers of men. He gave them clear revelation, and he told them that he would suffer and die but he would return again. This was a unique culture, and we need to see the Messiah through their eyes. Two-thirds of the gospel uh, took place in Galilee. Sorry. Weddings are a big deal in Galilee. Everyone in this little village of Cana was made aware of the betrothal first. When the father of the bridegroom draws up a contract and offers it to the bride-to-be. He offers her a glass of wine, and she has a choice to accept it or reject it. If she accepts it, she takes a drink of, of wine and then is given time to make the preparation. It may take a year or so to accomplish this. The bridegroom, on the other hand, goes home to prepare a house for his bride in, in or near his father's house. He also arranges for the feast that will last several days after the wedding. Not quite like ours today, huh? when the bride is in charge. We are told that only the father of the bridegroom knows when the hour will be. So the bride needs to be ready. It may even happen in the middle of the night. A shofar is blown, and all the people that have an invitation are welcome to attend. What excitement! The bride waits with her bridesmaids. She doesn't deal with the date, only the preparation. When the shofar is blown, the couple will re reunite as one forever. The, man, the men lift the bride on a litter and just carry her to the father's house. It's not her effort, it's the grace of God for her. She only has to be prepared and ready. The bride will enjoy the feast prepared by the bridegroom, and I'm sure you can see many similarities described in other scriptures regarding the marriage of the Lamb which is our destination. Let's take a look at um, what we know about the Apostle John and the first sign Jesus performed. A historian named Theophylact, a Byzantine Archbishop of Ored and commentator of the Bible who was born in Greece in 1060, writes that Jesus' sister Salome married Zebedee, and they had two sons, James and John. John, the one that's writing this gospel. The gospel of John is the only one to record the wedding of Cana. Theophilact writes that John is supposed by some to have been the bridegroom at the marriage in Cana. This could possibly explain why his Aunt Mary, the mother of Salome and Jesus, went to help with the wedding preparation, and why Jesus and his brothers were invited to the wedding. In the fifth story of The Chosen, we see Mary as a relative or a, fr a good friend of the mother of the bride. And whether John was the bridegroom or not, this wedding would have been an affair to which all were invited. It seems that at this particular wedding, they were out of wine. Let's look at some of the details re regarding this first miracle. Mary asked Jesus to do something about this problem. She knew that he could. He was God's son. 
Jesus calls her woman, not disgraceful in any way. In fact, he never calls her by her name. When the first miracle came about, it is like Jesus knows how this story is going to end. He says, my time is not yet come. Nevertheless, he's willing to lay aside his rather peaceful life up to that point and proceed down the path that the Father has planned for him. Jesus also provided, he did provide wine for the groom's family, saving them from horrible disaster, although he did so privately. Did you know that the family could have been sued in court for not having enough wine for the whole week? <laughs> in a small village like Cana, this would have never been forgotten. When Mary came up and told the servants, do whatever he tells you, they obeyed. She must have had some power of authority in her mind. Jesus used the six stone water pots that were used for purification. Stone pots were used because they were pure, but the stone was lifeless and empty, much like the Jewish people's lives at that time. The servants were to fill the pots with water. They did so to the brim, and then they were asked to draw it out and take it to the master of the banquet. They must have thought he was crazy, crazy to be offering these guests water instead of wine. Surely they weren't that drunk. <laughs> Did Jesus dismiss everyone when the water was changed into wine? Did he just speak a word like he did when the Father and Son and Holy Spirit spoke and created the world and the grapevines? He didn't violate nature but created from what he had in front of him. Scripture doesn't tell us how he did it, or even how much he did. But the guests didn't know what, how it happened. They just enjoyed the best wine forever. The servants and his disciples, they knew who was responsible for this wonderful, delicious wine. Isn't it interesting that God always reveals himself to those in lowly positions, like the servant, before anyone else. We read about this at Jesus' birth, didn't we? How God revealed the earth-changing event to shepherds first. The master of the banquet thought the bridegroom had saved the best for last. That seems to be Jesus' trademark. Jesus gave his wedding gift out of the full, his fullness and abundance. Some scholars think there was enough wine to last not only for this reception for the whole week, but maybe for the whole year, 120 to 180 gallons. Jesus always gives something better than what we knew before. And just like with wine, his joy increases with age. This means a lot when you get to be my age. <laughs> Listen to Psalm 92, 12 through 14. This is in the Living Bible. But the godly shall flourish like palm trees and grow tall as the cedars of Lebanon, for they are transported into the Lord's own garden and under his personal care. Even in old age, they will still produce fruit and be vital and green. Every time I think of it, I think of Harriet Martin. She's 97, and she just radiates with joy, doesn't she? After this miracle was done, the scriptures tell us his disciples believed. They had just seen a miracle happen. They tasted the wine of joy firsthand. Jesus, the Son of God, manifested his glory, and they saw his compassion and his love. Jesus, the Son of Man, was interested in everyday life and engaged in ordinary things like a wedding. He took part in their joy. Kent Hughes, 
talks about Christ serving the wine of joy. He says, The natural joys of life tend to run out sometimes in our life, but Christ produces a wine of joy that lasts forever. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Galatia, The fruit of the Spirit is, is joy. And to the Ephesians, he said, Do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Kent also suggests that Christ's first miracle, performed at a wedding, speaks to us of another wedding where Christ will be more than a guest. He will be the bridegroom, and the church will be the bride. Later in John, uh, John wrote Revelation 19, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Well, we have seen Jesus choosing the first disciples, changing water into wine, changing the old life under the law to the new life in the Spirit, based on truth and grace and joy. The chosen are changed, the water is changed, and now this brings us to the third part of our lesson, when the Lamb of God is changed. The Lamb becomes a lion as he enters the temple near the time of Passover. It is the temple where we see an angry Christ. Have you ever gone away only to come home to a house that has been ravaged, ravished by intruders and furniture strewn all over the place? How do you think you would feel? The temple was Jesus' home. When he entered the desecrated temple and saw the horrible sights of these animals, their smells, the wickedness and deceitfulness of the money changers, this was taking place in the place where the Gentiles were supposed to come and worship. All this stuff was supposed to be taking place outside. Not the corruption of the money changers, but the animals and all of that. It didn't take him long to exercise divine authority. With a whip in his hand, he chased the men and the animals out of this place of worship, and we can hear him shout, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a house of merchandise. He wasn't advocating violence, but he was demonstrating authority. What was the root of Christ's anger? The irreverence of the Jews toward God, his father. Sometimes we see it in our lifetime as, oh, he's the man upstairs. Something like that. Totally irreverent. The purpose of the temple was to glorify God. The temple was the place where the Ark of the Covenant was placed. It was where God's presence resided, where sins were atoned for annually. We seem to think of Jesus being meek and mild, However, Dr. Spradley, a pastor in California, defined meekness as power under control. Jesus was demonstrating his deity. It is his house. This example of how he took charge of dispelling the wickedness and corruption in the temple shows the perfect balance of who God is. As Christ lashed the whip, at the oxen and overturned the money changers' tables, he was as fully God as when he hung on the cross of Calvary. We learn today that when Jewish people questioned his authority and asked for a miracle or a sign to prove it, he told them, when this temple is destroyed, I will raise it up. Well, Josephus tells us that a hunt, that some of the stones weighed 140 tons. So you can imagine what the leaders were thinking. <laughs> but of course we know now that he was referring to his body as the temple of God. And he proves this statement by his resurrection power. When he said, I will raise it up, Jesus confidently claimed the power to raise himself up from the dead. 
And he repeated that claim in John 10, 18. Let me just take a second and read that to you. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. Then he goes on, the New Testament goes on and tells us that um, God the Father raised Jesus from the dead in Romans 6 and Galatians 1.1. 1, 1. And that the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead in Romans 1.4 and 8.11. The resurrection of Jesus was a work of each person of the Trinity each working together. This was God's plan from the beginning, that Jesus would come to the earth as a man, die on the cross for our sins, be buried, be resurrected. The spirit, if the spirit in he, of, excuse me, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Romans 8, 11 through 14. I just read all of that if you have a chance. Jesus did many miracles at the Passover celebration and many people were convinced that he truly was the Messiah. But some of them would only believe superficially. They were excited about the miracles they were seeing, but they really didn't understand that he was going to take away their sins as the sacrificial lamb and be crucified. F. E. Marr said he did not commit himself to them at this time, for he knew that they were not committed to him. Let me ask you this. If we are the temple of God, are we keeping it holy? Let's take time this year to meditate on who he is and consider our lives being under construction as his holy, righteous dwelling place. This is going to be the Holy Spirit's doing, not ours. I'd like to leave you with a, the words of a song that I learned Many years ago, it's called, it says, In a new and living way, Jesus comes to us today. Bless the bread and bless the wine. Bless each one, make us holy thine. Silently, sweet spirit, come and cause each yearning heart to say, My Lord has come in a new and living way. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for choosing us to be your children, changing us by your Holy Spirit, cleansing us from sin. Keep on renewing our hearts and minds that we would become like your Son, in whose name we pray. Thank you. If any of you have questions about the things that I've said today, I'd be glad to stay and spend some time with you. Thank you.